Hi everyone, I'm Shauna and welcome to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a will I buy it style of video. And I'm throwing my hat in the ring with this kind of content because I feel as though I have a bit of a different perspective. And when I watched this kind of video, I found that the creators come with the perspective of everything is on the table. And they're often justifying why they're not going to buy a product than when they will. And there's often this like implied interest and people like wanting to want things. So I often hear, this is most true with collabs, um, with like intellectual properties, you know, like Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Trolls or, um, or Mulan or Sailor Moon, those kinds of things where people are justifying that they're, or they're using language of, I'm not drawn to this palette. I don't know why, but it doesn't interest me. And so there's like this guilt and this justification of why they're not buying something because of the approach and the playing field that they're starting on for all of these products. In my opinion, our starting level for buying products shouldn't be that everything is a yes, everything is theoretically open to purchasing, or you're gonna start on a level of yes, and then you're gonna say things as to why you're not going to buy them. In my opinion, um, if the world ran according to Shauna, everything would be no, and you have to justify your yes. And I say this because when everything is theoretically an option, it also comes with the attached mindset oftentimes of like wanting to want something. So I hear a lot of justification and decisions being made um, that sound like, I really like this color scheme or I really want to try something from this brand. And so there is a financial and physical decision associated with those mindsets. I think that our thinking about what we own and our consumption, our habits, I think it should be more critical and deeper than that. And so I've been really interested in this will I style, will I buy it style of video and for a few years and also the decline of the anti haul. And that was a really specific beauty YouTube YouTubing kind of content. And I found it really interesting that that style of video declined. Um, like I feel like it's heyday was like 2018 and people were really active in talking about why they weren't going to want something. And I feel as though the consumerist nature of this space and our current cultural moment had like took over where people were tired of hearing other people talk negatively about products and they wanted to want stuff. And to me, that shift in talking both positively and negatively is emblematic or representative about our consumerist nature in that we, as like a collective kind of space, um, weren't really able to maintain this anti-consumerist standpoint. And that's not a hard and fast rule. And there's lots of channels out there who are being critical of cosmetics and makeup and collections. Um, and I love those channels. So in my video today, I'm going to be talking about 10 different products and I'm starting with a no and justify in kind of policy. And just because something I'm saying no to something doesn't mean it's not beautiful or aesthetically pleasing or the brand isn't doing socially conscious work. I'm going to ask you to think about your makeup collection today. And I hope that's something that you're interested in doing. So, Let's get into the products. Product number one are the Fenty blushes. They're beautiful. They are so beautiful. And Fenty is a brand that a lot of people want to support because they have done so much good for the beauty space, not just in diversifying the uh, their complexion products, but there's been a focus on people of color and darker skin that hasn't received the attention historically in, in this space. That's really important. And that's why a lot of people want to support this brand. However, this also comes attached with and supporting a brand like Fenty. What that has also meant for a lot of people is that because they want to support Fenty, they're making purchases um, of, so if a, if a cream, if there are lots of cream blushes being released, they're going to purchase the one from Fenty 
or they're going to purchase something new from Fenty so they can support the brand, the brand, in this case, the cream blushes. In my opinion, again, if the world was running according to Shauna, I feel as though that we should support these brands when it comes time to make a purchase, not supporting them because they have a new release. And I think this comes with thinking about our own collections and what we already own, because it's not a financially responsible decision if you're buying your 15th blush just to support a brand. You can support them when you have run out of products or when you are in need of a new foundation or you have a different you need a different color, things like that. Because we can still overconsume our favorite and ethically responsible, socially conscious brands. We can still overconsume them. And that shouldn't be an excuse that we use to buy more makeup. So specifically with these blushes, um, there's I think what 10 um released and Hannah Louise Poston has talked about this multiple releasing phenomenon and people looking at these things to pick the one for them. And I love that she talked about it because that totally applies here. You can look at all these blushes and pick the one like that's for you and that speaks to you. That's totally true. And so you feel justified in that purchase because it's the one for you. But I, I also want to talk about the difference between cream and powder products. And when I've been watching a lot of like channel declutters and collection videos in the past year, I've found that people are categorizing their cream bronzers differently and separately from their powder bronzers or their cream blushes separately from their powder blushes. And I think that people sometimes see these as different, that there are specific occasions in which you would use a powder bronzer or a cream bronzer maybe in the summertime or to achieve a more natural look and you would use them for separate things. However, what I'm saying is that you have two cheeks and you have one one face. A blush is a blush and a bronzer is a bronzer. So in this case, like you're still going to only use one blush regardless of if it's cream or powder. While you might choose them for different circumstances, they fundamentally have the same role of applying a hue on your cheek and so if we think of these things as separate, we're going to be building bigger and bigger collections. And I have like maybe it was like 12 blushes right now, 10, something like that. It's at least 10 years worth of blush that I have in my collection. And it doesn't matter how many are cream or how many are powder because they have to be used on the cheeks or however else you want to use a blush. So before you pick up or go and look, oh, I want this new thing from Fenty, how many years worth of blush do you already have? I'm going to leave it at that. The next item up is the Nicole Guerrero Glow Kit. And first of all, this, this feels like a lazy release from Anastasia because there is significantly less work done in this style of release than if Nicole Guerrero were to re-collaborate with Anastasia and and come up with a new product and it feels as though like no real work no real creativity is going into that and they're playing like they're they're actively playing on this limited edition mentality and bringing something back that was previously limited limited edition something that you didn't expect to see um anytime soon or at all again and so they're hoping that because you know they're releasing it from the vault that you will want to buy it but more than that this has six shades in it and they don't all really look like they are a variety of, sh of shades and I feel as though a lot of people wouldn't actually be able to use all six of those shades. They have different, like some of them are darker than others and so if you're not somebody who can use all six shades, then it feels a bit wasteful, you know? Um, and then the price per gram goes up because you're only going to be using three or four of the shades. And I also want to talk about the fact that there's six pans in here. So if we assume that one highlighter takes one year to finish, and that's super conservative, that's a super conservative estimate. How many highlighters have you ever finished in a year? But we'll take that as it's as the example. So if you use one highlighter per year, if you can finish one highlighter per year, 
then you have six years worth of highlighter in here. First of all, are you ever going to keep a product for six years? Also, what's the expiry? What's the expiry on this? If this is any shorter than six years, this product is failing you from the start because it's going to expire before you could ever potentially finish it. In the like fashion space here on YouTube, a lot of the socially conscious bloggers or uh, YouTubers talk about having things long term or wearing something for, let's say, 30 uses and thinking about the life cycle of your clothing item. So could you wear this t-shirt for five years? Would you want to? And if your answer is no, then you probably shouldn't buy it. But that kind of thinking, I don't really see brought into the beauty space all that much. But if we did, then would then I would pose the question to you, would you be okay with this palette in five years? Would you want all of these colors in five years? Could you wear all of these colors in five years? If your answer is no, you're buying this to throw it out. And to me, that doesn't feel like a responsible purchase because we haven't thought about the life cycle of our product. And even if we have and we're saying no, we're expecting to throw it out and we're never actually expecting to use up our product. And for me personally, that's not the kind of consumer that I want to be. I want to buy things to use them up. That's what they're there for. Makeup expires. So we need to go through our products. And if we don't have that intention from the outset, then we're buying things to throw them out. Let's talk about the Mulan palette. The palette itself to me is a bit boring and un uninspiring. I love a neutral palette, but this is just not the kind of neutral palette that, that speaks to me or that I would be interested in. They're not really my shades. But more than that, I want to talk about the intellectual property because I've been thinking about this a lot. And over the last couple of years, there have been more and more intellectual property collabs, but also specifically playing on or picking up intellectual properties from when like millennial kind of generation and maybe Gen Zers were youths, were children. Um, like Aladdin collabs, um, Lion King, Mulan as well, Sailor Moon. I'm sure that there's so many else out there, but I know that there are other collabs, other intellectual property collaborations that are more newer, like Frozen, or Frozen 2. The Disney villains as well, the princess collaboration, those ones like harken back to the to the 90s, early 2000s. And I've been really thinking about this concept and I hope that I can convey all of these thoughts to you in a succinct manner. When a brand is using intellectual property, they're preparing to convince you or attract buyers based on the intellectual property alone. And often when we're talking about older content, older intellectual property, they're selling you nostalgia and a feeling, a memory, and they're selling you on an experience. I know there's a lot of other types of industries and brands that do that, but in this particular content, in this particular market, that's what's being sold to you. So they're attracting you based on the intellectual property and not on what's inside the palette. And that's often the thing that we see. We're buying something because of the intellectual property. And sure, a makeup brand has can do that, but it feels like it, it's been a little unsettling for me to really think about this because at that point, the product becomes more about the intellectual property than, than the actual content of the of, of the product. It feels less important because people will buy it regardless. And they're using that as the marketing thing to get you to buy the palette. And if that wasn't the case, then they wouldn't be putting Mulan on something. They would just release it. And I've been coming, I've become less and less comfortable with that type of marketing. And like, that's what's being sold for you here with Mulan, same with Trolls and Sailor Moon. Next up is the First Aid Beauty sunscreen. And I am theoretically interested in this. It looks like it's like a tinted product, like a tinted moisturizer kind of look. Um, it is more of like a beigey color, which can be great for some skin tones who get a lot of white cast from sunscreen products. So that can be fabulous. Um, doesn't work for everybody, but neither 
to many sunscreens. So to me, that's not really the most important argument. But for me specifically, I wouldn't know if that color would be okay with my skin tone. I would have to check it out. And if the product, like if the ingredient deck looked good, I would be interested in buying it. Like it's, my radar is up. <laughs> it's flagged. But when we're talking about sunscreen, I feel as though we should only really have one or two open at a time because sunscreen expires. And that matters a lot because the sunscreen ingredients are no longer there. And where I live, I get all four seasons. I don't live in a, in a place of the world where it's warm and sunny all year round. So while I do use sunscreen most of the time, most of the year, my use is ramped up in the spring and summer. I'm more exposed to the sun, I'm outside more, I'm reapplying more, and I'm just generally more diligent. So if you have four bottles of sunscreen, then you're likely, and if you live in a climate like mine, then you're not going to be getting through all of your product before it expires. So when I finish my sunscreen, I would be interested in you know, taking a peek at the ingredients and um, maybe getting a tester of this and, and seeing what it's like. But I'm, I'm interested and I feel like it's a good move for first aid beauty. Okay, let's talk about the Urban Decay, the Moon Dust glitters and those lipsticks. First of all, the lipsticks are glitter. And I don't know anybody in my own life who I've ever seen wear glitter lipsticks on the regular. I don't. I don't personally wear those kinds of things. So if you were to buy this as like, ooh, like it's a fun little interesting thing to, to diversify my routine. If you're not going to use this all the way to the bottom, then you're buying it to throw it out. And I feel like many of us are in that position with glitter lipsticks. Now, the body glitter. I personally don't understand body glitters because I don't get why you cannot use a regular highlighter on your body. We already have highlighters and many of us have more than one. So why not just use that? And furthermore, many of us use body glitter when it's in the spring and summertime, if you are again in like a four climate kind of place. And if you're somebody who lives in a warmer climate, you tell me how often you wear body glitter. And so the actual time of year that I would theoretically wear body glitter and probably you as well, or body highlight, is so small. So I would be using this product at a rate that's two or three times slower than any other product because of how little of the year that I would potentially wear it. So it just seems wasteful. Like if I'm only gonna wear body highlight in the summer, I'm just gonna use one of my highlighters. And I feel as though that should be the case for most of us. Many of us have so many highlighters. So I don't know, use what you have. That's my bottom line here. Okay. Let's talk about the new Melt palette. This one is like the Rust palette and they already have the Rust stack. So they're building on the success of this Rust stack. And for me, because they already have the Rust stack, the palette makes less sense. I guess perhaps if they're phasing out the stacks because a lot of people kind of feel as though they're, they function a lot like single shadows, but less so because like they're stacked on top of each other and you can't see them. So it's a, I don't know, it's a bit of a lazy release to me because like they're duping or using this thing that they already have. But what I want to talk about most here is its function as a neutral palette because I think this palette for a lot of people is going to function like a neutral palette. And the neutral palette zone is I think really wide. And I'm going to pull on the Artist Couture, their new, their new palette as well because this is, that one is a neutral palette too. And that one to me is more neutral, more every day. But I think they both have a place in that, in that zone. My question to you and why I'm bringing this up is how many neutral palettes do you need to have before you say that's enough? Like, I'm not being a jerk here and I'm not trying to make anybody feel like crap, but I'm genuinely wondering like what's the number, like what's the threshold? Because I know a lot of us, myself included, I have at least three or four neutral palettes Unless we draw a line somewhere, we never will because then we're going to always be wanting to want stuff and accumulating more and never feeling like we have enough. So 
where, where, when, when and where do we say we have enough? For me, these are just out of the question because I already have neutral palettes. And if we're making these choices, like, well, I don't have a neutral palette with yellows in it, so I should, so this is a good option. Are we really just gonna buy this palette because we like Melted because we want a yellow shadow? To me, that's not the best use of money. I mean, you can use your money however you want, but getting one palette because it has like one or two different shadows doesn't, like, doesn't seem like a smart inv investment to me. And if you have so many neutral palettes, how many years will it take you to use these up? And will you be happy with your 12 neutral palettes in like 12 years? No, they'll expire before you get a chance to use them. And you'll have so many that you'll declutter them. So again, you're buying something to declutter. That's my take. Okay, let's talk about another palette. It's the new Sugar Pill palette. The picture is going to be on the screen. This one looks exactly like the Jouer Tan Lines palette. It's also going to be on the screen. They're so similar. If you have this palette, you don't need it. But also, this palette, I mean, a lot of people have talked about how they hate the, like, the design of it. And I don't like the design either. However, what I dislike the most about it and what I haven't heard anybody talk about is that the brand has decided how much of each shadow you're going to use. So, like, the coral is the biggest pan size of them all followed by like the green and the blue and in a palette like that the green and the blue are going to be like my least used shadows and the more neutral colors are like the smallest or like the medium sized pans I don't understand why that's the case because I think for a lot of people the blues and the greens are going to function as like tertiary kinds of shades or they're going to be the secondary the secondary types of shades that people are going to use they're not going to be the one that they use the most so i don't know why i don't know why melt made that decision and i wouldn't be happy with that because i don't use blues and greens i feel as though if you're a person who uses blues and greens you already have some in your collection so you probably don't need more and if you don't have blues and greens it feels to me a bit like wishful thinking and playing into your fantasy self like I would love to get into color. I would love to use the blue, but that's not what, what your track record has shown. That's not what my track record has shown. So it would be for me a waste of money and it might be for you as well. Okay, let's talk about the fresh new, uh, their new lip, what are they called? They're the, like the, not the lip glosses, the, the lip mask, the, I'll, I'll put the name on the screen. Now, these I am not interested in buying because of the ingredient deck. I don't know if these are super popular, people are like running out to buy these, but I have learned over the past couple of months that I need to be or I'm most concerned with having clean lip ingredients because you ingest your lip products. And I can't control what I already have, but I can control what I can purchase. And the ingredient deck on here is not good. Fragrance appears like halfway through the the list and then it also has limonene, linalu, and citral. Is that right? Let me look. Yes, and it also has several colorants in there as well. And I'm not cool ingesting those things because I don't know how they compose their fragrant components or how many ingredients in there and I'm not cool with ingesting that. But also what I find a little bit sketchy is on the Sephora website, um, these products are listed in, like they're under one listing and you like select the, the fragrance or the type that you would like. But all of them, there's only one ingredient listed. It's the same for all of them. But they can't all be the same because one is like mint, another one is like I think a blood orange, there's, and one's a watermelon, there's three different kinds. They can't all have the same ingredient deck they have to be different because they have different flavorings. So I'm wondering where that flavoring is coming from if they're giving me one same base formula. And so it feels a bit incomplete to me. Maybe I just need more education so I can understand that better. But at the moment, it just doesn't sit well. And either way, I'm not gonna buy it. Last up are the new Stila shadows or like the glitter and glow duos. And these are, these, these are interesting. First of all, 
they're duos. You have to buy them as a duo. And there's, there's a release of 10. Six of them are bright shades. There's like a like a darker pink, a red, green, yellow, blue, purple. Those are all bright shades. They come with like a glittery shade and then like a more matte shade. There's four more like neutral colors. There's a black, a white, a brown, and then a gray. If you watch Project Pan videos, in the past year, there's been a lot of panners who've been finishing these. And they all said pretty unanimously, steel and glitter and glows, they dry out so fast. And like they're huge, you get so much product in them. And then like when I, when I think about, okay, you're gonna get two, are you gonna actually use them? And then also like when you think about the colors there, are you somebody who wears blue, green, yellow eyeshadow on the regular? And then you're getting them in liquid products that have a lot that have a lot of product in them and dry out quick. To me, it's just like a combination for just like a really hard pass. And I personally feel so like liquid cream powder pot shadows are like the most unpopular shadow types. People, I think, at least that the kind of vibe I get off the YouTube space is that people prefer powders. So if that's the case, but they also have liquid and cream shadows, I feel as though they're usually treated in the same way. They treat their powders the same way they treat their creams and their liquids. However, creams and liquids expire much faster than powders. So you're going to have to actually use your cream and liquid ones, liquid shadows. You can't just let them sit there because they're going to dry out. They're going to expire. They're going to become contaminated if you or contaminate if you keep them for so long. And so are you gonna get through all of your shadows? My answer is probably, I don't think so. And I, I have about 15 and like, I can't buy any more until I get through a big chunk of them because otherwise buying more, I'm buying things to throw them out because they're gonna expire. So I think we really need to be super careful about the liquid and cream shadows that we buy not just in quantity, but also in color. And the more like obscure or colorful that a shadow is in liquid form, the less likely we're gonna use it and the more likely we're gonna throw it out because it's gonna expire. So these are all a pass. The only thing I've been maybe interested in would be the First Aid Beauty uh, sunscreen. But again, that would be down the road. I hope you found this video informative and interesting. I would be curious to hear your feedback down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again back here soon. Bye.